in Galatians, where it sums up pretty well. In Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. The focus of most, if not all, of Paul's letters was unity in Christ. Knowing that Christ is the incarnation of God, this is not a surprising focus. It is through Christ that we come into relationship with God. It is through Christ that we come into relationship with one another. We cannot even for a second deny that there is diversity around us, though. Even if we limit our scope to this single sanctuary or the pew that we are sitting on today, we can see that we are unique. Every person has their own unique appearance, their own unique dialect, a unique job, a unique set of beliefs. I can go on for hours at what makes each of us unique, but you get the point. However, even though we are all unique, we have one common thread holding us together, and that is that we are all children of God. Just a few weeks ago, Reverend shared baptized Ella Grace Hilliard. A very important aspect of the baptism was our communal recognition of our own baptisms. Whenever one is baptized, we are all rebaptized. Whenever one is baptized, we all remember, which is even more important. The significance is that through this recognition of our individual baptisms, we are recognizing that we are all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that we are all children of God. In Paul's letters to the Galatians, Paul points to this same baptism to explain that there is no separation between one person and the next. This was in a time of upheaval and strong belief that if someone was not like you, they were wrong. And as much as I hate to say it, it probably wasn't too much unlike today. What is even more astonishing is that Paul doesn't just bring all of those in the present who he was talking to into union, but he ties them all the way back to Abraham, assuring that those who are in Christ are the descendants of Abraham and therefore part of the covenant with God. We see in other letters from Paul that he doesn't totally do away with the things that make us unique. He does continue to address slaves as slaves and men and women accordingly, and he even continues to use ethnic distinctions. However, these are not the things that we can do away with, but they are the things that God ignores. God sees us for who we are and not who we are by definition. When we jump back to the laws in the book of Leviticus, we see that this lack of distinction wasn't a completely foreign idea. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love them as yourself. Earlier this week, I took the time to go to dictionary.com and find out what a stranger really is. Dictionary.com defines a stranger as a person who is not a member of the family, group, or community, or the like. There's no mention of this does not include. So there you have it. Even in the book of laws that many people turn to today in order to cast someone out, we are told that we are to welcome those people in and to love them as ourselves. Throughout Leviticus 19, we find a great focus putting on strengthening one's relationship with their neighbor. Whether they are a neighbor whom you have known for your entire life, or someone you have just met today from an outside land. What's more is this wall and deterioration of boundaries was not just set by some random person, but rather this wall and all those in the chapter are handed down to Moses by Yahweh, further enforced throughout the entire chapter by the Hebrew, thing, Hebrew phrase, Ani Adonai Elohim, translated as I am the Lord your God. For this reason, they never took these 
controls lightly. Have you ever taken the time and tried to sit down and have a conversation with someone who you do not agree with? Unless you are a rarity, I bet you are quite uncomfortable, arms crossed, very guarded, and maybe even a bit defensive. We all fall into that mode on occasion of something we believe is being challenged. You can ask my parents about how I do it. If someone says or does something that makes us uncomfortable, we will retaliate. It is a human thing to do. But I wonder, what would happen if we actually engaged in conversation with this person rather than arguing or defending? That is what the law given to Moses, to Moses is trying to get the people to do, to essentially sit down and engage rather than to argue to welcome one another rather than to slam the door shut. I think that we are all familiar with the story of the ugly duck. The version that I remember goes something like this. It was a dark, stormy night when the wind was so strong it could pick up a boulder. A nest of eggs that was sitting by the lake was disturbed. One egg, much lighter than a boulder, was pushed, was pushed down the hill by the wind until it came to rest in a new nest. The mother duck, not knowing how in the world one of her eggs slipped out from underneath her, quickly pulled the lost egg into her warmth, and there it sat until it came time to hatch. Well, the day finally came, and the eggs began to hatch. As the eggs hatched, beautiful baby ducklings came out of the shell and began to waddle around. One egg didn't match, though. Very worried, the mother duck found her spot sitting on the egg once more until finally it began to move. The ducklings and their mother gathered around, very excited, and watched as they saw the crack slowly creep through the egg until finally a large gray head popped out from the egg. Very confused, the ducklings began to look at one another and then to this new duckling. They were, each one of them was a beautiful yellow. But this new duck was gray. Something had to be wrong. As the ducks began to grow and to learn their way around the pond, the gray duck, who we will call Buster for the sake of this story, was always left out. His brothers and sisters made fun of him and let him out of the games they played. When they saw him coming, they would quickly swim away. It seems that the only duck who loved him was his mother. No matter what she did, she couldn't seem to get her other children to recognize Buster as part of the family. But she never shut him out. She fed him, swam with him, relaxed with him. Mother never let her baby be alone. And then it happened. One morning when Buster woke up, he looked up and saw all eyes on him and all beaks dropped open. Very confused, Buster waddled over to the lake and looked down at his reflection. <coughs> He was no longer the goofy-looking gray ball of feathers, but a beautiful swan. His brothers and sisters had spent so much time ignoring him that they never saw Buster's transformation, but his mother just smiled, so she saw the whole thing happen. Do you see the connection? This story that we use to teach our children the importance of not shutting a person out because they are different isn't just for the kids. This story is a perfect summation of why we should let go of our own differences and welcome one another in. I don't know that the mother duck ever truly thought that this egg was hers, since I think we all know a mother knows what is wrong before anyone else. But she saw the need and she took it under her wing. Even after the eggs hatched and she saw that Buster was different, she never cast him out, but continued to nurture him the way that only a loving parent could do. I don't think that I would be too far off base if I suggested that this is the way that God sees us. We are all different. However, no difference is ever enough that God would cast us out as a child. Just as the mother duck encouraged her ducklings who did not listen, to include Buster. God encourages us and even gave us a law. This is the point when it can be all too easy for us to say, this sounds great, but Paul wasn't speaking to us, he was speaking to the Galatians. And the laws that were given to Moses weren't for us, they were for the Israelites. But 
But we have to remember that baptism, the one that establishes that we are all children of God, not just connected to those people living today, but all the way back to Abraham. Paul was, in fact, speaking to us, and the laws were for us. As Christians today, we are called to look beyond all differences and distinctions and welcome strangers in. Theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher addresses the kingdom of God in his writings about essence, essence logical hope. In it, Schleiermacher explains that the kingdom of God will come when all of humanity comes into full God consciousness, essentially meaning that all humanity not only recognizes, but is completely dependent on God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. The original Greek actually tells us that while the kingdom has been and continues to be present in heaven, it is not yet present here on earth. So how do we get there? How will all of humanity recognize and become completely dependent on God, bringing the ever-present kingdom in heaven and the presence here on earth? I think Paul, and we'll throw it out there, Yahweh, gave us a great start. When we strive to look past all earthly distinctions of age, race, gender, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, <laughs> political affiliation, education, anything that makes us different. We subsequently begin to welcome in those strangers that Yahweh spoke of to Moses. When we can begin to look to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can begin to work towards bringing the kingdom of God into action here on earth. Last week, I took a few minutes to sit down with our church of Bulletin to see how we are breaking down boundaries and welcoming all who we come across into this coming kingdom of God. I was very pleased with what I saw. Every week, we open our doors to at least five groups. Our prayer list includes not just members, but friends and family of members. The announcements even start with an invitation to all in the greeting. You. We also included two organizations outside of our church which we support. I'd be willing to say that we are on the right track. But if I learned anything during my four weeks working as a chaplain, it is that sometimes we have to be willing to ask the tough questions. So I'm going to put that into practice. We opened the doors so that other groups can use our facilities. But is there any member present? Has anyone ever been here to welcome people or to further our hospitality? What can we do for these groups who regularly use our facilities so that they know we are more than just a building? I know that we have made efforts in the past periodically, but are we consistent and intentional about this? We read names in the bulletin, in many cases the same names for weeks and months on end. And many individuals will send cards and keep people in their prayers. But do we as a church do anything to reach out to these friends and family so that they know we are not just praying for them on Sundays, but continually thinking and praying for them during the week? We send flip-flops to Ronald Rescue Mission, but have we thought about going down there as a church to learn about what they do and maybe even work for a little bit? I know from experience with the mission camp I used to direct, they have a really disorganized food pantry, and they always need help. What can we do as God's children once we vote, as a church and as individuals, to reach out a bit further? We can listen. What is the story behind the story? When we meet that person who takes us out of our comfort zone, imagine what we can learn if we actually listen to what they are saying. We may not understand everything that we are hearing, and we may not agree, but we are all still children of God. God doesn't focus on our differences and let them get in the way of God's love, so why do we let them get in the way of our own love toward each other? As humans, we come to know God through our earthly relationships. Those relationships that we foster can be the avenue for the kingdom to truly come and for God's will to be done. As Jonathan said last week, 